So good morning and welcome to the Georgetown University School of Continuing Studies, the host for this morning's panel. And our panel is entitled Declaration of Independence, Not All Mergers Are Created Equal. My name is David Goodfriend and I am an adjunct professor at the Georgetown University Law Center as well as a senior industry and innovation fellow at the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy, the sponsor of today's event. And I want to welcome our viewers who are live streaming today off of the center's website uh, from all over the country and the world and welcome all of you who've come this morning on a particularly cold day. I feel like I'm back in Wisconsin. I don't want to be back in Wisconsin. I'm happy to live here in DC, but it feels like a Wisconsin morning. Maybe that's a good sign. We live in a time of rapid change in our media landscape. New technologies, consumer preferences, and business relationships emerge at light speed. Some basic questions still arise, however, about who provides the content that Americans consume. Consolidation of media distributors and creators leads us to ask, should we maintain voices independent from the big conglomerates? If so, is there a role for public policy? And do all media mergers have the same effect on independent voices or are some different from others? These are some of the topics we will address today. But first though, I want to establish some ground rules. The views of the panelists here today are their own and not their clients or their companies or their organizations unless they themselves otherwise indicate. Many of us up here, myself included, have professional relationships with stakeholders in ongoing merger proceedings that are happening right now in Washington, DC. But today's panel is a Georgetown University event intended to be an exploration of ideas, not a debate about specific matters currently before the government. Second, I want to reassure all of you that we will have a period for questions after uh, our prepared questions and our panelists have a chance to answer them and you all will have a chance uh, to ask questions. At such time, just raise your hand and um, Brad or myself will call on you and we just ask that you speak loudly enough uh, so that we and the other audience members can hear you and we'll repeat the questions. We, oh, we have a wireless mic, even better. We'll run around like, what's his name, Geraldo. I'll hand you the microphone and make sure you get a, a mic. So with that, let's meet our panelists. Robert McDowell, can you guys each like wave when I raise your hand? There you go, Robert, good to see you. Robert McDowell is a partner in the communications and telecommunications practice at Wiley Ryan LLP, where he provides strategic legal business and public policy advice to clients on important domestic and international matters in the telecommunications media, technology, and digital media industries. As a former commissioner and senior member of the Federal Communications Commission, McDowell has been an industry and government leader on a multitude of complex issues in the communications field throughout his career. Thanks for coming, Robert. John Leibowitz, sitting next to him there, is a partner at the law firm of Davis Polk, where he focuses on the complex antitrust aspects of mergers and acquisitions, as well as government and private antitrust investigations and litigation. Between 2009 and 2013, he served as chairman of the Federal Trade Commission and was a commissioner from 2004 to 2009. Additionally, Leibowitz worked for many years as a lawyer in the Senate Judiciary Committee, including as chief counsel to Senator Herb Cole, Democrat of Wisconsin, where I met him as a fellow staffer, and I can say those were the glory days for John and me. For me. <laughs> uh, sitting next to John is Roy Meyering, the senior director of business development and strategy at the fastest growing international sports network in the US, BN Sports. With nearly 15 years of experience, he plays an instrumental role in business development, affiliate sales, and the conception of strategic solutions to further the network's performance. Before we get to the rest of the panel, I'm gonna turn it over to my friend and colleague, Brad Blakeman, to introduce the rest of our panelists and kick off our discussion. Brad? Thank you, David. My name is Brad Blakeman. I'm a member of the adjunct faculty here at Georgetown. This is our new School of Continuing Studies. How many people have been here before? Pretty cool building, 90,000 square feet in the heart of a, a, a bustling Chinatown. And uh, as you saw by our Chinatown sign, we are in integrated now within this community. We have 600 students 
who study here all through the day. Most of the students are seeking advanced degrees, but um, this is our premier new school here at Georgetown in location, and we're very proud to have a joint venture today with, a, with our School of Business. Um, what David failed to mention is that uh, he was a senior advisor to Bill Clinton, I was a senior advisor to George W. Bush, and if anything, this event shows there can be a little bipartisanship <laughs> in this town, and we'll begin with today's presentation. Um, I'd like to introduce Jonathan Adelstein, who is the president and CEO of PCIA, the Wireless Infrastructure Association. Mr. Adelstein served as a commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission from 2002 to 2009. At the FCC, he achieved bipartisan progress on issues including broadband expansion, widening access to the internet and media diversity. And in 2009, the Senate confirmed him as the administrator of the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Rural Utility Service, where he oversaw a $60 billion portfolio in rural electric, water, and telecoms infrastructure loans. Thank you for being here, Jonathan. Andrew J. Schwartzman uh, ran the Media Access Project for 34 years. MAP was a nonprofit public uh, interest in telecom law firm, which represented the public in promoting the First Amendment rights to speak and to hear. It promoted a well-informed electorate by ensuring a vigorous debate in a free marketplace of ideas, which will be continued here in this discussion. And he was also a chief legal strategist in efforts to oppose major media mergers and preserve policies promoting media diversity. Mr. Schwartzman now is the um, counselor at, and we welcome you, uh, a fellow Georgetown uh, member of our staff to the Georgetown University's Law Center's Institute for Public Interest Representation. Thank you for being here. Michael Schwimmer is CEO of Nuvo and Fuse Networks. Nuvo TV, formerly CTV, is the premier English language destination for Latino entertainment and Fuse is a national music network in 2012. Schwimmer engineered a partnership with Jennifer Lopez. She's not going to be here, by the way. Um, and Nuvo TV. <laughs> and in 2014, Schwimmer spearheaded the $226 million acquisition of Fuse from the Madison Square Garden Company. Prior to CTV Media, Schwimmer enjoyed a long tenure at Echo Star Communications, where as their Executive Vice President of Programming and Marketing, he led the way in new and innovative technologies. Schwimmer oversaw all marketing initiatives, acquisition, and packaging of traditional subscription and on-demand video programming, as well as advanced interactive TV services, television advertising, sales, and international programming. Thank you, Michael. Well, let's get started. As the title suggests, today's panel uh, is about uh, mergers. Are they all created equal? Independent programmers are a specific type of content creator. So I'd like to start by defining exactly what is an independent programmer and why should we care about them. So let's go around to each panelist. The question is, what is an independent program and why should we care about them? Who would like to start? Why don't we start from this end and then just go down the panel. Okay, well, uh, an independent programmer uh, is uh, a, a, someone who produces or distributes content uh, but is unaffiliated with other programmers or with distribu distributors. Uh, uh, therefore, they, they do not have some of the same constraints uh, uh, that, uh, that other programmers do, but they have many, many more challenges. Once again, textbook definition, I would just add why it matters. Uh, there is a need for diversity of voices in, in any civilized country, in a free country where there's especially a democracy that's vibrant as ours, to have a diversity of viewpoints feeds, I think, the discourse, uh, elevates the ability of the, of the country to learn about uh, itself and about the world, uh, and it's important that uh, the distributor and the uh, content itself, that there be a diversity over, over the distribution pipes uh, so that we can have uh, that kind of discourse. The Communications Act itself, I think, embodies the, that principle in so far as it calls for a, a diversity over, uh, over the public airwaves. So from a practical perspective, an independent programmer means you're somebody with no leverage to get done what you need to get done. <laughs> and that's really what it means on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I'm sure we'll get more into that. But 
the bottom line is most of the television programming on TV, no one ever asked for. It was put there through non-independent programmers that had the means to get it there. So independent basically means you're kind of out there like a ship on the ocean among the big waves, you know, hoping to get to the other side. I, I would echo the previous comments and simply add that, you know, independent programmers are quite important because they introduce that um, opportunity for the end consumer to actually make a choice in terms of their programming. Uh, they're not spoon-fed specific programming packages um, as they may be put together by some of these distributors. And it's that freedom that, that certainly allows for that viewpoint diversity to continue based on what we can bring to the table. So, and I think it's terrific to be here with two very successful independent programmers and uh, agree with everything all the panelists have said. Um, I do think it's important also when you're thinking about mergers um, to remember that what the uh, antitrust division or the FTC, in this case, uh, uh, in the case of the two major mergers that we might be talking about today, the antitrust division and the FCC do, is to look at uh, is to look at the markets from the perspective of consumers. It's not from the perspective of competitors. It's from the perspective of what is good for the consumer in the antitrust world. It may substantially uh, lessen competition. That's the antitrust standard that's applied. At the FCC, it's a public interest test. And with that, I'll turn it over to an expert on public interest tests, which is Rob McDowell. Mr. Chairman, it's an honor to be seated next to you. <laughs> it, it is. No, it is. We had a very good uh, working relationship over the years, uh, starting in your Hill days, actually. Thank you for having me. Uh, great to be here. Uh, and um, by the way, uh, uh, further to the further uh, David's uh, disclaimer from earlier, I will not be commenting on the specific mergers uh, right now. Uh, I will be speaking about themes, history, process, other things, but. Uh, none of my remarks should be attributed to commenting or analyzing the, the two big mergers that you've teed up as a, as a teaser for this event. But I think the question was, what is an independent programmer? Uh, the one word answer would be uh, Glo Glozell. People are, you don't know who Glozell is. Look, oh, come on. You're, you're not part of the tens of millions of people who watch Glozell. She just interviewed the President of the United States last week. Yeah. Great lipstick. Right. Okay, Great everyone lipstick. knows. Okay. Raise your hand if you know who Glozell is. Okay, nobody here knows who Glozell is. Okay, you do, because you're hip. You're hip. All right, there we go. I'm not hip. So um, entrepreneurs in, in the programming space, and uh, happy to talk about a number of themes about the uh, fragmentation of, of distribution as well as uh, content and the lower barriers of entry that we have today for both. Now, the question, the next question is, does independent um, ownership lead to a diversity within the market, or is it conglomerates can take care of, of the diversity within the marketplace under their own authority and leadership. And we'll start with you and then we'll work backwards. Okay, alternate, and we'll start in the middle, and then we'll do yeah, odd and even, and then <laughs> black shoes, brown shoes, no. Um, so, uh, first of all, I think the marketplace is, is much more fragmented. Um, you, I have a funny feeling uh, that some of the viewpoints on this panel will be uh, still sort of anchored in the days when we had three network uh, TV stations or channels, uh, networks. Um, and uh, we have more avenues for distribution um, and lower barriers of, in of entry. Now, if you want to get on a linear cable channel in the traditional uh, cable TV or MVPD sense, uh, you do have to deal with uh, those players. Uh, but it depends on how you're defining the media market. Uh, I think it's a much more robust market than when I was a kid, certainly. I don't think anyone could deny that. Um, and you can have folks like Glozell, uh, or you know, if you look in the music side, like Arctic Monkeys, they became known uh, through the internet. Um, and I know Jonathan Adelstein knows who the Arctic Monkeys are because he knows everything about music. Uh, Might so have played harmonica with him. You probably <laughs> did, I think. Um, hopefully your lips didn't freeze on the harmonica because they are from the Arctic, aren't they? Anyway, uh, he's quite an accomplished uh, harmonica player. But uh, so I think uh, this is actually a wonderful time to be a content entrepreneur. Depends on your business plan. But the eyeballs and the ad dollars are going to different platforms. Uh, I rely heavily on uh, a time-tested focus group uh, for my data on this, the McDowell children. Uh, so they uh, have three kids, ages 15, 13, and 7. And the mobile screen is their first screen by far. And they are watching over-the-top content by far over linear channels. Um, and uh, I think there's other data that, uh, you know, uh, more objective data that proves that out. So everyone on this panel, I think, needs to think about what's their business strategy for that, as well as what should be the public policy strategy for that. I think going back to the 
days of FinCEN and, and pretending there are three uh, TV networks um, is not the way to go. I think that'd be counterproductive for everybody. Yeah, and I, I think that is a, it's a great question. It's not subject to the kind of uh, sort of Euclidean geometric proof that some things are, um, but it is clear that it is a great time to be a consumer. There is, there's more programming out there and more of a diversity of voices uh, than I think you have ever seen any time before. And I think as a general matter, that's a good thing from the perspective of, of consumers. I do want to mention one other, one other point, just uh, 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 for full, in the interest of full disclosure. Um, my law firm, although the views you hear, as David said, um, are my own, uh, my law firm, Davis Polk, uh, does, represent, um, does represent Comcast, so I want to make sure that people understand, understand that. But the views today are mine. Go ahead, Roy. Great. Uh, so I, I think in terms of being sports, uh, I mean, we consider ourselves to be really the uh, embodiment of viewpoint diversity. Uh, in, in terms of our product offering, as, as previously stated, we embrace you know, all delivery platforms uh, uh, and, and vehicles for content, uh, both traditional and OTT, given what we offer today. Uh, in terms of our feeds that we cater to in, in the US, we independently staff a English uh, feed and, and team, and obviously a Spanish team as well. But I think what really sets us apart as well is um, what we create for uh, the end consumer, and that's really pooling the resources uh, that we have from our, our five continents uh, and, and really our, our massive rights pool to bring the best analysis and the best and exclusive access to that end consumer uh, in the method that they want to consume it at. So, so <clears throat> full disclosure, uh, my company does business with with um, all of the members of the current two mergers. So um, that means I have no stake in the game whatsoever. <laughs> so, um, and, and I spent 10 years on the distribution side and roughly 10 years as an independent programmer, so I'd like to think I've sort of been a little bit on both sides of it. Look, I, I guess I would go back to what um, Robert said, there, there, there are a lot of new ways out there to get content. There's hundreds of thousands of YouTubers. You can click on anybody, and anybody with a, with a phone and a camera can go out and create content and maybe get to interview the president. Um, all of that is true. Um, uh, at the same time, today, there's roughly 104 million people that pay for what are called traditionally MVPD services. The, the, the um, uh, despite all of the talk about cord cutting and so forth, by 2018, I think that's supposed to be down to 102 and a half. It's going to be around a long time. And, um, and while it might decline, it's still going to be in the vast, vast majorities of, uh, of American TV homes. And so if we're willing to live in a world where we say, OK, the new world is very diverse, and anybody with a camera can make something happen. But in this old world, which is actually television pretty much as we know it today and will be for some time to come, and, and diversity is not important there. Um, so anybody that's paying 50 60 70 80 100 dollars a month, you know, you can do so with the knowledge that that, that all of that programming is owned by one of five companies, and if people are happy with that, and we think as a public policy that's a good idea, and, and, and anybody that wants diverse content should just you know, click on the internet because they're not going to find it on the pay TV, then that, that's an approach. My view, though, is that while there's a lot of new distribution methodologies and it's a lot easier to find independent content on the internet than it used to be, there is still a, a, a world we live in today that's going to be around for a very, very long time, which is very influential um, on people, families, immigrants, elderly, younger. It's, it's, um, it may be a little bit boring, but it's not going anywhere for quite a while. So I think that that's why these particular mergers are undergoing such scrutiny, not because it's the old caboose, but because it's still a very vibrant part of our media lives today. No, I'd say the short answer to the question of whether uh, ownership affects viewpoint diversity is yes, ownership matters when it comes to viewpoint diversity. Absolutely. This is something that, uh, again, I turn not to, to my own opinion, but Congress. Congress actually embodied that in the Communications Act and with the assumption that they, it wanted media diversity in order to have uh, ownership diversity in order to have viewpoint diversity. Uh, and so the FCC has to take, take this extremely seriously. I mean, using the, the great example, thanks for the kind words about my harmonica playing. I won't bother any of you with it this morning, but uh, 
<laughs> now, if I was to play harmonica and throw it up on YouTube, would I rather have that, or would I rather be on MTV uh, playing harmonica with the Arctic Monkeys? I think we all know the answer to that question. And if uh, I own MTV or if I, my name is uh, Jonathan Malone and uh, was in that family, would I be more likely to get onto a cable system? Absolutely, I would. Uh, so yes, it matters, and, and yes, it's something that Congress cares about, and I think it's something that the FCC cares about and should care about. Um, a great friend and mentor of mine died the other day named Peggy Charon, who was the founder of Action for Children's Television and uh, caused a revolution in the quality of programming available to children. Uh, in the 80s, uh, as she continued to press for improvements on television on over-the-air stations, uh, people started saying, well, you know, there's Nickelodeon. And she used to refer to that as let them eat cable. Uh, I, I think to talk about the, the wonderful opportunities that are available in this fragmented uh, environment uh, for putting stuff online, uh, it's great. Uh, it's not the same as being able to get mass distribution of a linear channel. And it boils down to let them eat YouTube. Uh, there is a link between uh, ability to distribute effectively over the top and what's, what you can distribute as a linear channel. Uh, cable operators increasingly uh, link agreements for program carriage to stringent limitations on making the same content available on the internet, on authentication procedures, taking a piece of the action, all manner of ways that cable companies can influence the online distribution of programming as a condition for cable carriage. So uh, these mergers uh, and I should add, I too, uh, uh, I have a private client that I represent uh, on a small piece of the uh, uh, Comcast Time Warner charter transaction. I, I emphasize charter because my client, which is Zoom Telephonics, has a beef with charter. Uh, but this, uh, uh, this has no relationship to what I'm talking about here. Uh, these are important issues in, in these pending mergers. The people who uh, uh, increase the gene pool of ideas, of content uh, for us to benefit from uh, need distribution. And consolidating those means of distribution causes serious public policy problems and interferes with developing the kind of diversity that Jonathan Adelstein has been talking about. Okay, now that we've defined independent programmers, let's see how they fit into the larger landscape of uh, the media in today, 2015, and even beyond. So the next question is, what are the unique, unique challenges to independent programmers in today's marketplace and in the climate of mergers? And who wants to lead that off? I won't. Well, all right. Um, and feel free to jump in. Look, I, I think that <clears throat> at, the, at the end of the day, the topic seems to be revolving around distribution. So look, the unique challenge, of course, and, and I say this with, with uh, enormous empathy um, for the distribution side, um, uh, that there are, that, you know, the cost of goods, if you will, the cost of content uh, that cable operators, uh, satellite operators, telco operators um, have to pay every year is increasing well above inflation and well above their ability to increase the consumer's bill. Um, it's, it's a very competitive industry these days, so it's not always um, as much as we hate our rising cable costs, uh, the fact of the matter is that um, that they do have rising costs, and um, 
And, and there's a lot of competition, which uh, makes it very difficult to pass those costs along because if you raise your price too much, as a cable operator, telco is going to take your subscriber, or satellite is going to take your subscriber, what have you. So all of those are very real business issues. Um, but those business issues, um, which I have a lot of empathy for, are the same ones which basically provide the foundation for I, I, want, I don't want to say an excuse, but let's just call it a high degree of reluctance to take on new networks and new costs when you don't have to. Because the fundamental dynamic that goes on um, b between programmers and, 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 and distributors is um, what do you have to do? There's very little that goes on on a voluntary basis in that environment. You have to imagine it's, it's a forced marriage. There is almost no free will going on. Cable operators are not taking on things because they want to. They're not doing almost anything they want to. Programmers are, 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 are forcing their content on, and, 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 and the price that you arrive at is, is after an enormous amount of teeth mashing. It's, it's uh, you know, these are all sort of, um, it's, it's the proverbial, you know, arm wrestling backroom deal. And um, having been on both sides of that arm wrestling, um, I can tell you that it's nasty, it's very rarely friendly, and, and, and generally nobody feels good at the end regardless of what your press release actually says, right? And so, so you can imagine, it's a little bit like Dorothy knocking on the door of the Wizard of Oz, like, you know, people are in the back room fighting over billions of dollars, and a little guy comes up and knocks on the door and says, hey, uh, I'm over here. I got this kind of network, and, and I'd like you to pay attention to me and, and launch my network. One, you can barely get their attention because they're so busy fighting over billions of dollars in the back room, but they have no, you, you, they, they have very little, um, what I would say, um, uh, motivation um, from a free market perspective to do anything. Because cable's a closed universe, right? Think about it. If you put a billboard up for a website or a radio station or a broadcast station, somebody drives down and they look at it and they say, okay, well, that looks interesting. I'm going to check it out when I get home and they can log on or they can tune their radio. That's not, that's not the world we live in. In, in, in. The cable world is one where you can't see what's not there. And if you can't see it and you can't experience it, you can't demand it. There's no reason for you to expect that anyone is going to demand something that they don't they don't know, they haven't sampled. And so it's a very easy position for the cable operator to be in to say basically, well, my customers aren't demanding it, so why would I take on something that no one's demanding? It's a, really a self-fulfilling prophecy. So it's a long way of, of, of basically saying that, you know, fundamentally, um, the, 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 quality, you know, uh, the quality programming on television is not carried because it's quality television. It's quality television because it's carried. You have to understand that. It's not like somebody says, hey, I have Mad Men. Would you like to carry my network? No. AMC was around for 30 years distributing dusty movies before to, to build up the economic wherewithal so that they could create and deliver Mad Men. Right? It's the carriage which creates the programming. Obviously, you need creative people to, to do that. But it's the carriage, it's the economics, it's the, it's the platform. It's not the programming which creates the carriage. I, I think at least in, in our position, we would probably add to that. I mean, certainly, I don't think anyone here could, could disagree with the sensitivities around bandwidth constraints for uh, satellite or, or telco or cable, for that matter. But I think that uh, in our particular case, the sensitivity in terms of challenges for independence uh, has to do with potentially discriminatory, uh, sorry, discriminatory treatment. Uh, based on um, you know, whether a channel is delivered in standard definition or in high definition, uh, whether there is actual authentication in terms of OTT products that in the end are you know, uh, zero cost to the end consumer, uh, and uh, especially with regards to uh, tier placement. And obviously there's upper echelon tiers where uh, products can be limited or part that can price out that, that product. Uh, and certainly that's a difficult prospect uh, to compete against, uh, especially in the cases where some of these vertically integrated companies also own channels that compete and acquire programming that uh, also is on the block for our particular case. So it's, um, it's really a, a sensitive issue that I think requires some attention to. 
Robert? Brad, I'm, I feel like I'm sitting next to uh, the guy from A Beautiful Mind right now. So Chairman Leibowitz is furiously scribbling brilliant <laughs> things here, and I want to hear what they have to, he has this to say. Is, I, I think this is more like the uh, Unabomber, actually. If you look at that, <laughs> that's, that's, that's <laughs> right next to the exit. Uh, so. share, share your manifesto with us. Go, you go no, I want, no, you go. I, no, that was, I was delivering you. So, so I, I, listening to what you're saying, I, I think at 50,000 feet, I, I absolutely agree with it. Um, I, I, I scared about 25,000 feet. Well, no, no, we're only going to get down to 20, okay. 27,000 on this question. We'll get back to other things. So I was, but you've got to remember, for the antitrust and the, um, and the, uh, uh, for the antitrust agencies and the FCC, it's about, you know, what's, you know, is there harm to the consumer and what's in the public interest? And, um, and so, and I've been, you know, I, I have been in different perspectives as well. I was, uh, we reviewed at the, uh, at the uh, FTC, uh, the Adelphia acquisition by Time Warner and Comcast. Um, uh, when I was on the Hill, um, uh, we did a lot of, and I worked on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, David was, uh, was a colleague of mine um, in Senator Cole's office. Um, we did a lot of hearings on, on major mergers. And I remember, um, I, and that's a predictive, and again, that's a, that's a, for the agencies, and I think for members of Congress who are, uh, uh, are looking at these things and are looking at these deals, and for the witnesses, it's, it's a very, uh, uh, it's a predictive non-science. And I remember a consumer advocate testifying uh, at the, um, at the uh, CBS Viacom merger that uh, this could be, and it was the same time as AOL Time Warner, uh, that, you know, these two mergers could be the end of democratic self-governance as we know it. And, of course, it turned out for different reasons that those mergers uh, turned out to be less than, uh, less than feared. And I think, so I, I, I hear you about the sort of bare-knuckles nature of uh, negotiations with MVPDs, and you've been on both sides of it. Um, I was watching a little La Liga last night on, uh, on uh, TV, on, on, on um, uh, my uh, Xfinity platform at work, uh, and um, you know, uh, there's a way to get there. There may not be every single way to get there, but again, for the folks who make the judgment, who we have a lot of confidence in, the the Rob McDowells, the Jonathan Adelsteins uh, at the FCC or their successors, um, y you know, uh, uh, they're the ones who have to sort of separate the wheat from the chaff and figure out what's in the public interest. Can I can I quibble a little bit, uh, Jonathan? Uh, you correctly state the sound principle of antitrust law, that antitrust law is there to protect consumers, not to protect competitors. However, the other side of the jurisdiction is the Federal Communications Commission, which has a broader mandate under the public interest standard. And part of that mandate is to promote competition. The reason you want to promote competition is ultimately to benefit the public. But the FCC quite properly takes a broader look and, and addresses the concerns of competitors precisely because it does affect uh, the public. And Congress has said you should do that because it's critically important. So I agree with that too. Yeah. Can I jump in real quick so on the, on the kernel of the question here, which is and well, very well stated. So I, I think we can say, uh, for the record, safely, there are laws on the books uh, that uh, protect consumers and uh, protect markets and uh, can help entrepreneurs here. Um, I think the question, though, was about challenges um, of independent programmers. Um, but also, when you look at challenges, you have to look at opportunities. So I do want to go back to the fragmentation of the market and also the fragmentation of distribution. Um, I was a big proponent, as was Jonathan Alstein, for unlicensed spectrum, um, and that, that helps, uh, I think, uh, promote a variety of platforms. Uh, we say, see the cable industry trying to uh, use a lot of unlicensed uh, so you can have TV everywhere, uh, as the brand name goes, and other things like that. So there's some tremendous opportunities. Um, and the Mad Men example is actually a very good example, which was actually, that was rejected by HBO. That was presented to HBO as, hey, you want this? And they said no. Uh, and Jeff Bukas uh, publicly has said that was you know, one of his biggest misses, right? Um, and so A&E was able to pick it up. And granted, we're, we're still talking about the context of linear cable channels. But let me drop a quick foot, footnote here, too, uh, regarding piracy. So what, what role would piracy, intellectual property piracy, have in all this? And for the record, I am strong, a strong advocate of property rights. I think we need to do more to uh, um, prevent piracy and, 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 and prosecute those who steal others' property. But what is pirated out there uh, can also be a disruptor. Uh, in a way, that can be a, a benefit to independent programmers. 
And by the way, there's a difference between live sports and scripted programming, let's say, right? So there's different uh, buckets we have to talk about with their various analyses. Um, but that piracy shows what consumers want to watch. Uh, there's free content or cheaper content out there because of pirates. I'm not saying pirates are doing a, a service to anybody. Uh, they're doing a disservice. But this shows the disruption in the marketplace of content. And if an independent programmer either puts their content online purposefully or if it's somehow pirated, people are going to watch it either way. And you're going to get uh, you know, eyeballs into the millions like a gazelle or whatever. Um, and so there are lower barriers to entry today. We, we can't keep thinking of it as just uh, three networks uh, you know, or, or these oligopolies of content. Content, is, it's very risky to produce it. People may not watch it, even if it's uh, put out on a broadcast network uh, TV. Uh, and the vast majority of the shows they bet on fail. Um, if, you, if you look at the, the front end, the wide end of the funnel of all the scripts they consider, um, and then what do they uh, uh, produce just to get pilots, then what pilots actually get aired, they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars in programming, most of which goes down the toilet, and it's rare to get a Friends or a Cheers or a, uh, the, the Office or other things that then help subsidize uh, all these other risky ventures. So. Um, it's risky for everybody, um, and as the market becomes uh, more fragmented, the, the barriers to entry are lower, and it's going to be interesting to see who succeeds. It's going to be those who have the most compelling content. It might be sports rights, um, uh, but it's also going to be the, the best quality scripted content, which is very expensive to produce and very risky to ever make money on to begin with. Uh, so so the, the there's two worlds out there, basically, right? If the, the MBBT world, with cable programming is a dual revenue stream model. So an operator pays a license fee uh, per subscriber per month. That's the general model. And there's advertising revenue as well. So I would tell you this. First of all, if something is pirated, the programmer gets neither a license fee and, neither, and, and, and there's no ad revenue. So, so there's, no, there's no economic benefit to, to, to anybody having their stuff pirated. And if you put it out online, yeah. um, not only do you not get a license fee, uh, but you may well be breaching an agreement with your cable operator because as um, uh, Mr. Schwartzman said over here, um, there are restrictions on doing that. But there, those are not, um, those restrictions, in some ways, they make sense, right? Because if someone is going to pay you every month for your programming um, so that they can provide a unique service to their customers, they don't want their customers to be able to go get that same content for free because it defeats the purpose of having a, a pay package. So I'm, I'm not unsympathetic to some of the restrictions, but, but the problem is, the problem isn't that there's a restriction against sending your content for free online because the truth is why would why would they pay for something that someone else can get for free I, like I say I'm sympathetic in that respect but if if you're not able to get distribution and at the same time you can't put it out online so if someone has I'm going to pick up pick a, a number that doesn't apply to any particular distributor 10 15 million homes and they give you a th they, they give you you know a million or two million of those homes you don't get the other 13 million homes and they say you can't put any of your content online then it's a problem because they're neither giving you the distribution but they're also saying you can't send your content anywhere else so there is a tension there between the amount of distribution you have and your ability to monetize that on what are some of these emerging platforms that Robert's talking about but I think I'd add to that. In, in fact, that's one product offering that you would be limited to that subset of subscribers, which is fine. But if you have a greater amount of content than can be seen on those linear feeds, and you're able to complement that and, and produce a platform that can be authenticated, allowing the end consumer to see all the rest of that content, I think that access to that ecosystem is only logical, and it's only going to complement that service. And I think. To your point, it's great, and I appreciate the ratings point, of course, for, for La Liga that we had. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, unfortunately, that is a, a standard definition feed that we have that's through Comcast, which in all of our other partnerships doesn't exist. So we all know that sports programming is best viewed live. It's fast. Uh, there's, um, you know, a, an, an amazing amount of uh, production that, that goes into it, and 60% of our programming is live. 
Uh, more importantly, with the particular leagues that we have, and as you mentioned before, for sports, sports is appointment viewing television. It's really DVR proof, and it's sort of the last bastion of what you want to watch live. So if you're limited to our two feeds, that's really a small fragment of what you can actually see. And uh, in the case of, of some of the operators that we have, for the most part, they have authenticated our product uh, ubiquitously, except in this particular case with Comcast, where it just happens to be a small sliver. And we're certainly working towards that, but I think that's the idea, is trying to give the most amount of content to the end consumer. Well, let me, let me just say, and I, and I think that's a great point, and I think we're going to talk about authentication later, and sure. I am no expert on authentication. But I do know that, you know, if, if, you're, if, if part of the concern is sports, pro, it's, it's sports programming, we're not in every possible access point to consumers, I sort of get that. You want to be, that's what you're supposed to do. You're, you know, you make content. On the other hand, you know, you can get it, I, I think, you can get um, you can get uh, be in sports on your cable system. I was watching it in my office yesterday, um, and so again, you know the the things that regulators and enforcement agencies have to do when they review mergers is they have to figure out you know is some is every is a complaint a legitimate one that raises public interest or competition issues or is it something less than that and that's what we rely on the the FCC and in this case the antitrust division to do um, and uh, and it's a complicated and I just want to make one other point and I'll stop uh, it's a very complicated ecosystem and I think you know and at the FTC we brought a lot of challenges to mergers we really we we, we, we were we, we sometimes didn't uh, when we thought that the law didn't call for it, but we brought a lot of challenges to mergers, and um, and and again, uh, uh, you want to let when you can, you want to let the marketplace work because it's a very dynamic marketplace. You don't want the government intruding, um, you know, into uh, a, a, when it can avoid it, into aspects of uh, of negotiations. So. Jonathan, I agree. The last word on this. Well, just yeah, I'd say that uh, you know the market definition, of course, is essential when you're looking at that. And, and to, to Rob's point, it wouldn't be the morning if we didn't take on Rob on something, go back and forth. But the fragmentation only gets you so far. I mean, the companies I represent in the wireless space have much more bandwidth constraints due to spectrum and due to uh, you know infrastructure than you would have over over say a wireline uh, cable provider or particularly a cable provider. So if you could look at uh, high definition in particular which you might not be able to get on your, the kid's screen that you're looking at, that they're constantly upping the, uh, the amount of data that they're using. Uh, you can't get good HD right now. I'm hoping someday we can with more spectrum, more infrastructure. But uh, that's why I think the FCC is looking at defining uh, broadband at 25 megabits per second for purposes of the competition report, because that's what some of the cable providers are saying is necessary to get the kind of experience you want uh, to have multiple people in the home using, uh, using uh, television high def signals or uh, ultra high definition, which is, I think I was looking at Comcast website last night, 15 megabits per second, they were saying on their website uh, was necessary for that experience. So unfortunately, something we can't yet get on wireless, so that's not somebody who would be a legitimate competitor for that kind of a service. Hopefully someday they will be. And let's turn the rest of the program over to, to David. So we, we've now started to talk about, uh, as, as uh, John was saying earlier, we're moving into the realm of what do the agencies that review mergers think about. We've established what an independent programmer is. We've established some of their unique challenges in the media marketplace. But now let's shift the focus a little bit to the policy making and the decision making whenever a merger comes up uh, before regulators and enforcement agencies. So I guess the, the first question that comes to my mind is given the challenges that we've heard described here, does a merger make it worse? Does a merger make the challenges that we've stipulated worse or, or is it relatively insignificant uh, in the lives of an independent programmer because they've already got it tough and it's just going to stay tough. So let me start uh, by uh, asking Roy uh, to weigh in on this. When you see in your distribution activities a merger occurring, uh, does, it, does it signal to you that things are going to get more difficult for you, less difficult, or stay the same? I think it, it's it's a it's certainly a complex question. I mean, a, a, at the end of the day, you know, I think consolidation uh, is is good, but I think that it's dependent on the strength of its framework. So, in this particular case, in terms of mergers, how we address it, I mean, certainly we've had achievements um, having launched and. 
less than three years on nine of the top 10 operators uh, here in the US. And uh, we've achieved great distribution uh, beyond some of these uh, higher tiers and HD and, and OTT authentication. But I think um, one sensitivity that we have in terms of particular uh, mergers is, is really the ability to have a more anti-competitive strategy or discriminatory strategy that could be enforced on uh, one of these operators that happens to be acquired. And we could actually be rolled back in terms of the achievements that we've already accomplished. So uh, for us, at the end of the day, we're in this to provide the best possible programming to the consumer in the most versatile way possible. And Jonathan Adelstein, I want to pick on you for a second, because <clears throat> you and I are friends enough that I can do this publicly. You, as a commissioner, wrote separately in uh, accompanying statements to FCC merger orders, uh, together with uh, former Commissioner Michael Copps, we are concerned that consolidation is going to shut out independent voices. These are merger orders. These are things that are on the record. So surely you must say, in answer to my question, that yes, a merger makes things harder for independents by definition. Is that right? Well, I think it really depends on the context. You know, it depends on the particular merger. I mean, for example, you've got AT&T and DirecTV, and I've heard from independent programmers that uh, uh, AT&T Uverse has been more sympathetic to independent programmers than DirecTV. And so if you have them take over an entity like that, all of a sudden you might have a preferential uh, situation and context for them. So you have to look at the behavior of the company. You know, what's their record on independent programmers? What uh, do independent programmers themselves say when they're going behind the scenes, behind closed doors, and they aren't worried about what their uh, carrier about is, being is thinking. As we speak. Uh, being filmed. <laughs> I mean, there's a few eyes out there I see from uh, our Nobody's friends. watching. No, don't worry about uh, it. So, so, so uh, what, do the, what do the independent programmers say about the actual practices? I mean, can a, a news channel that has a deal and a condition get where it says uh, it was supposed to be? Um, are they being treated well? Uh, you know, and this is something that justice can look at, the FCC can look at under protective orders. There's a little debate about that right now. <laughs> Uh, going on, but uh, you know, I think that somebody like an, an Uverse, which had as its business model having uh, very diverse programming, is different than some more traditional MVPDs that might not have had that as their business model. So, you know, these companies will maximize profit, and it, I'm not saying one carrier is good and one's not, but what is their business model and how does their attempt to, to profit affect independent programmers is something that I think is very relevant to. Uh, merger considerations. Okay, so now I'm going to pick on Michael Schwimmer because we used to work together and, and uh, I used to like getting picked on by him when I was junior to him as an executive, so now I'm going to pick on you. You just heard a, 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 a former Democratic commissioner at the FCC say, by God, there are some mergers that actually may be better for independents. Do you buy that? Look, I'd say a couple things. So first, Anybody who's a seller, in general, wants to have more buyers. It's just whether I assume you're selling cars or ketchup or television networks. So the reduction in the number of buyers is typically not seen as, as a positive force for somebody that has something to sell. And independent networks are sellers of their product, which is their television network. Um, and that's at a very high level. While it, and, and, and I would just state for the record, you know, I think uh, I personally and our company has a good relationship with all the participants in the two mergers that are going on today. Um, and of course, people do different uh, business uh, uh, somewhat differently. So some folks are going to feel like one merger might be more or less favorable than another. But I think that, look, um, management teams change. Um, people retire, philosophies of companies change, and so I don't think that I, I personally, when you look at something of the magnitude of the mergers that are under review, I, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's a great idea to just say, you know, in the last five years, who's been a good actor, who has been more difficult with independent networks, because at the end of the day, what you have is you have you have a number of sellers, which, which is a number of buyers, which is going to be reduced, which isn't uh, a reason to necessarily deny a merger. That's antitrust. That's public policy. I'm just stating a simple fact that most people want more buyers rather than less. Yes, John. Um, so, so, so just to wrap it up, all I would say is at the end of the day, what you, which, which you come all the way back to is, is a combination of, I guess, antitrust, which 
my personal view is it's, is, is it's not a great place to start for, for, for television. Um, um, and then uh, and public policy, which is the realm where this really lies. And, and, and you have some very difficult public policy questions um, uh, regarding approval, and if so, under what conditions. But I don't think that any independent, any independent that steps up and says, this is good for me, is making what I would say a, 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 a personal decision based on recent history as opposed to the longevity, uh, as opposed to the industry as a whole or the longevity of what that relationship could, could look John, like for them over years. Well, I, I think David makes a, or Michael makes a really good point. And, um, and, 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 and again, I think you got to rely on the agencies to do the right thing. And I'll, I'll just give you an analogy from a very different marketplace. Um, or I'll give you two. So one is uh, the FTC uh, uh, brought cases against, um, against Google uh, for a privacy violation and for not honoring its commitments on, to, to license, on, uh, to license uh, in fair and reasonable non-discriminatory ways. Lots of letters against the FTC not to bring that case. Brought the case anyway. A more analogous instance is, um, is a case we didn't bring. And that involved Express Scripts, a PBM, Pharmaceutical Benefit Manager, buying, um, uh, buying Medco, another PBM. And they combined would form the number two, they were number two and number three, they could form the largest PBM. Now, pharmaceutical benefit managers, and I'll try, not, I'll try to do this quickly, um, are buyers of pharmaceuticals. So the inputs are pretty analogous to programming here. You had, you know, the driver of cost, I think even you said this, Michael, um, is, uh, is programming to some extent, or at least that's going up much faster at a faster rate than, than the cost to consumers. The biggest driver is sports programming, which, uh, uh, or one of the biggest drivers is sports programming, and as an input. And in the pharmaceutical area, the biggest drivers were brand pharmaceuticals, um, the highest driver, that's sort of analogous to sports programming, and, uh, and pharmaceuticals, uh, generics, which were also going up. And the FTC got 85 letters and calls from members of Congress saying, block this deal. They were from competitors. They were from chain pharmacies. Uh, they were from, uh, they were private calls uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the agency from other PBMs saying, you shouldn't let this happen. And if you do, by the way, why don't you let us buy the specialty pharmacy uh, 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 component? And, uh, and at the end of the day, we thought at the FTC that letting these two companies combine and aggregating their market power, not in an illegal monopsony way, but just in a bigger buying power way, was going to drive down the cost of pharmaceuticals. Uh, and uh, we let the deal go through because we didn't think it lessened competition. We actually thought it would enhance competition. And if you look at healthcare costs, the brightest, the, the, the brightest place I wouldn't say a bright star, but the brightest place in healthcare costs now is pharmaceuticals because the cost curve has come, to, come down, and that's in part because of, uh, because of this merger which allowed them to drive down, which allowed Express Scripts combined with Medco to have a bigger market share and drive down prices. So I think going back to your point, Jonathan, it's contextual. And I think when you look at the two deals that are, uh, the regulators and enforcement agencies are considering now, one in which the companies do compete in some ways, one in which the companies do not, I think at the end of the day, I think both of them can be pro-competitive and pro-consumer, but I'm pretty confident that if they're not, one of those two agencies or both of them will step in. Well, let me just address this then to your colleague, uh, Robert McDowell, because you wrote, yes, get pumped for this one. It's coming straight at you. Um, in the Comcast NBC Universal order, uh, out of the FCC. He's so upset, Brad. He's leaving the room. I don't know what we said, Brad. but uh, <laughs> <laughs> these are two former Bush White House uh, aides. Brad cannot watch his friend being no, no, uh, uh, cross-examined by a Democrat. <laughs> um, you wrote in an accompanying uh, concurring opinion in the NBC Universal merger that while you approved uh, of the merger uh, being um, uh, granted. You had grave doubts about all the conditions that were being put on the merger by the agency. And just to make sure I define my terms up here, very often regulators at the FCC or antitrust enforcers through a consent decree will allow a merger to go forward but with 
conditions that that agency then enforces either through a court or at the agency itself. And those conditions are meant to address what are perceived to be harms coming out of that merger. So my question to you is, uh, are those conditions, Robert, effective? We've now seen it play out multiple times and in fact directly with respect to independent programmers. Here's what you, the merging parties, can and cannot do with respect to independence. So does it work? Is it an effective tool? Or were you right the last time when you said, I've got grave doubts about putting all these conditions on a merger? Yeah, and so excellent question. So um, it depends on the philosophy of the regulator, and not to overly generalize, but I think uh, Republican-led uh, FCCs have a different view of what is in the public interest in terms of merger conditions versus a Democrat-led FCC. Uh, Republicans tend to look at uh, whether uh, the merger is causing uh, specific harms. So are there merger-specific harms that should be addressed through conditions versus other conditions that may not have anything to do with the merger? It might result in um, the conditions could produce nice things, uh, build out of broadband facilities or laptops, uh, free laptops or subsidized laps, laptops to school children, things of that nature. But did that really have anything to do with a merger in that case? Uh, where Com it was a vertic uh, vertical merger of Comcast buying a content company, NBC Universal. Um, and certainly there are public interest issues regarding a vertical integration like that versus a horizontal integration where you're not taking out a competitor. I'm not speaking about any specific merger when I'm saying that, but are you taking out a competitor or are you um, buying uh, something you know, vertically uh, integrated in a vertically integrated fashion? Um, so. Uh, there's just two different philosophies. I think uh, you, you, you saw Comcast in this uh, case uh, come in with a lot of preconditions uh, that they announced very publicly and, uh, and uh, keep beating the drum on um, in anticipation of the FCC in particular having a more expansive view of what the public interest standard should be and reasonable minds can differ on this. Um, and uh, so I, I think they're waiting for that. But as a matter of public policy, I think you know, if there is a Communications Act uh, update written in the next few years, we do have to ask the question of how many agencies should be looking at the same transaction. I think that's a legitimate question to ask uh, as you modernize your statutes. And you've got okay. a terrific, and just a, a, yep. I'll wrap up in just a sec, you've got a terrific um, set of expertise and statutes at the Federal Trade Commission and, and, and Department of Justice. In a way, FTC has a bit of a broader footprint than DOJ in terms of what it can do. It, th that jurisdiction that will be taken away because of the common carrier exemption as of February 26, when the FCC uh, classifies inf information services as telecom services. So the FTC will have a much more di diminished role in this space generally. Um, and you won't have things like Section 5 of the Federal Trade Commission Act uh, applying um, uh, to common carriers. So that's something okay. I just like, wanted to. All right, I, I, I would get into net neutrality, but we don't have an additional five hours. So <laughs> I'm going to leave that one aside for now. I do want to. And no one else can comment on it. Just I want just, my just words you, to hang. Just you. Right? I got you. You want to okay. leave that out there. Okay, okay we'll good. let you have that. We'll thank you. Thank that. you. Appreciate it. Uh, I will come back to the topic of whether antitrust or Communications Act uh, enforcement is more appropriate in these instances. But I want to stick with this topic of conditions on a merger. And I'm going to ask uh, the three gentlemen sitting closest to me, starting with you, Michael. Merger conditions uh, in Comcast Universal designed to help independents, successful or not? Look, I'm not an expert on conditions. And I would say that, um, to me, those particular conditions pointed um, you know, pointed the parties in a, in, a, in, a, in a good direction, whether or not they were successful. I don't think those conditions were designed to cure all, you know, all evils, right? I think they were, they, they were not designed to change the nature of relationships between all independent programmers and all MVPDs. So it really depends, you know, what you mean by successful, and I don't, I'm not, certainly not trying to be coy about it. Um, there were some, some of those conditions, of course, uh, resulted in, in, in new networks being launched. I don't think any of those new networks today are necessarily what I would call household names. Um, uh, but there are businesses out there, they're employing some people, um, and maybe some of their programming um, is getting watched. Um, uh, but I, look, my, my, my view is, is they're directional. 
right? They're directional. It's, it's, they don't, they don't, I don't think anyone would pretend that they're a panacea that is supposed to solve, a, per se, a problem. John, your view, successful or not? I mean, Rob, Rob had a point. Sometimes conditions are just like pushing water uphill. If a company doesn't want to do it, they can find a thousand ways around it. What we're talking about now is over the top. And what are the different ways you can imagine all the complex ways that a company that controls the pipes could alter the ability of over the top competitors to get their programming directly to the public? And we've heard a lot of allegations in particular cases about that. Uh, and that's the future of competition, perhaps, and what Rob was talking about in terms of fragmentation. But if the owner of the pipes has so many different ways of doing it, and it's hard for an agency like the FCC to keep up with conditions that it might put on to continue to have that. Sometimes you just have to ask the question, is it even possible to do that? Is, is, a, is it better to go up or down? I mean, you know, my colleague Mike Copps in this case, in the last merger you talked about, said no, which just with all the massive conditions that were there, uh, he opposed it because of the control of content um, by the distributor, the vertical integration we were talking about. I'm not saying that's what I would have done because I didn't look at that uh, particular case. I was thankfully out of there by then. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but sometimes, you know, the conditions are, it can be very difficult to enforce. And, and it's better to make a decision just up or down sometimes on these things. Well, let me, let me modify the question and toss it to you, Andy, and then I want to hear as well from, from the other end of the panel. Perhaps we'd be better off just with a straight thumbs up or thumbs down judgment on mergers and skip the conditions altogether. Do you think that's a better way to regulate? Well, the obvious answer is the right answer is it depends. <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, here's what I would say. Uh, I used to be, well, first of all, we're talking about behavioral conditions here. There are often times when a structural condition, you will approve this deal if you sell off this line of business, such as John was referring to a specialty pharmaceutical business or something. Uh, those, those can address a specific kind of problem that can happen you know, during the acquisition where one line of business could be problematic. Uh, those can be great. Uh, behavioral conditions, I used to be more sympathetic to them but experience over the last 15 years or so has taught me that they simply don't work very well. I'm constrained by an NDA uh, uh, from, from discussing the most extensive experience I've had trying to enforce a condition, but it was brutal. Uh, there are public instances uh, that are relevant here involving Bloomberg and neighborhooding on, on Comcast and the Tennis Channel's efforts. Wealth TV's efforts, uh, uh, all of them trying to uh, take advantage of provisions in conditions and consent decrees uh, and FCC conditions in order to uh, improve their program carriage position. And they are fought, there's delays, it's expensive. You've got a big company that's got no interest in speed and has got deep pockets, and you've got a little guy who needs to get on. Who, who, who can't get a revenue stream going to finance the litigation. Uh, uh, it's very difficult to write conditions to anticipate every possible condition, and uh, uh, it, they, they have proven to me over time uh, to, be, uh, 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 to be much less effective in practice than they appear to be on paper. Okay, and now therefore, I, I'm much more attuned to just saying, if there's problems, say no. Thank you. Now, I want to get to you, John, but I believe we're on the cusp of a newsmaking moment. Because I just heard perhaps the most progressive member of this panel when it comes to these issues say, I don't like behavioral conditions. If we should just have a straight up or down vote. And Robert McDowell, in your accompanying order, uh, 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 opinion, as I said, to, to the Comcast NBC Universal merger, you, uh, too, you two expressed grave doubts about conditions. So, is it possible that the two of you are actually in agreement on the proposition that better to have a government agency say, government agency say yes or no, as opposed to coming up with a lot of behavioral conditions? Do you agree with what Andy just said? So, uh, excellent question. Very good technique there, David. I like By that. The way. Yeah, you're good. I'm you're on to you. Good. I'm yeah. on to you. Yeah, no, this is good. You are trying to make news. Um, so let me tamp that down. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry, no news making today. In, in the, uh, great at making news. In the, the <laughs> yeah, no, I try not to. 
uh, in the joint statement with Commissioner Baker, which was four years ago this week, by the way. I was just thinking as you were speaking. Um, uh, Bir we talked about non-merger specific uh, conditions, right? The, the, yes. the conditions that had uh, to do with things that had nothing to do with the merger, right? Um, so that, I think, uh, is something that's, that's a bad idea. That just becomes more of a shakedown uh, by the regulator than anything. Um, but as I said before, I, I do think m maybe there's some agreement as to, as to whether or not then we just look at the consumer harm, um, the harm to uh, the market more generally, uh, to programmers, because that's our theme today. Um, and that should be looked at through uh, maybe just one lens. Maybe just have one government agency looking at that, and maybe it's not the FCC if we rewrite the laws. Okay, well, you sidestepped my question, but I'm going to let you get away with it. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I almost thought technique. we were going to have a moment here. He is, he is um, but uh, John Lee was, let me ask you this question. You chaired the Federal Trade Commission at a time when the commission negotiated historic consent decrees, 20-year-long consent decrees, behavioral consent decrees with respect to privacy in major online companies, Google and others. It, it, and and so it, it is, I, with, you know, recognizing it's a little bit different. Hold on, we're having a technical moment before you answer. No, it's okay. I'll, I'll ask. I'll, I'll make my question last really long so he can get his tie straight. <laughs> so uh, understanding that those were Section 5 consumer protection uh, matters, not merger matters. Uh, let's stipulate that. But it does, it does sort of bring into focus your view as a former regulator whether or not consent decrees can be an effective way of guarding against merger-specific harms uh, when they address behavior, because we have two independent programmers here who would then be living under those uh, rules. Let's see if it works. What do you think? So, so it's a great, it's a great question. Um, let me just start by going back to a point Rob made before, which is whether you should have a, a you know two agencies reviewing telecommunications mergers or media mergers. I happen to believe that because it's, it involves sort of core values around the First Amendment. That, that, that it's, it's pretty reasonable in that area to have both an FTC and a Justice Department, or a Justice Department, um, and an FCC review. Um, I, I suspect if Congress were rewriting the antitrust laws, they might only have one of those two antitrust agencies doing the review. Um, but I think it's not a bad idea, and in fact a good idea, to have a separate FCC review because of the First Amendment freedoms that are involved. But that's Congress's call. Um, the second point I wanted to make, which goes back to yours, is on, um, is, is, is on consents. Um, in, the, in the privacy context and in the consumer protection context, I think behavioral remedies are actually critically important. In the antitrust context, um, I think both agencies, uh, 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 particularly, uh, particularly now with Bill Baer, um, have refrained from, and with good reason, doing behavioral remedies in the horizontal context. You can look at a deal like uh, 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 Ticketmaster Live Nation and see all of those bells and whistles, and that's pretty aberrational. I think for the most part, you want to block a deal if it's anti-competitive or have a structural remedy. You must sell off this. Um, Let me stop you there. I think that's an important point. So in the context of antitrust, if there are anti-competitive issues, you would rather see a structural remedy for divestiture as opposed to behavioral remedy for behavior I, I, I think that's right. It doesn't mean that a behavioral remedy won't, won't be appropriate on occasions in a vertical deal, maybe even in a horizontal deal. I, I won't say that we haven't done it, the FTC hasn't done it on occasion. But I think the better way to do it is structurally. Now, if you look at the NBCU, uh, Comcast, uh, behavioral remedies, which are often not at the core of the, uh, which are often not at the core of the merger itself, um, I think for the most part, um, uh, for the most part, uh, people have, uh, there can be disputes at the margins, for the most part, people have, have sort of recognized, I think generally, that, that Comcast has honored those commitments. Um, on the other hand, and there is a framework for litigating some of them, as Andy, as Andy pointed out, uh, but um, f again, it, it, you know, some of those things do get resolved, uh, will get resolved through litigation, through settlement, to the extent that there are concerns. But then this goes to another point, too, which is, one of the reasons why you want to be very careful about these behavioral remedies, ultra-virus to the merger itself, is, is because, you know, one of the, and I'm not talking about anyone in particular or any particular, indus, uh, any particular industry or company, um, whenever you see a big merger, not only in the telecom area, although particularly in telecom and media, there's a lot of just sort of rent-seeking behavior. 
right? You know, people throw mud at the targets, or they go bad, they, or, or they say, "I will." You know, we really want to support your deal. I, we see this in all different. We saw this at the FTC in all different kinds of mergers. Uh, we really want to support your deal, and we don't go, want to go in and see the FTC and oppose you. But by the way, um, you know, you'll need to give us X, Y, and Z. And so again, you know, a, 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 again, the role of the antitrust agency and the role of the FCC here, um, I think, is to sort of do the right thing. Try not, except when they need to, uh, to effectuate the public interest, to effectuate uh, the anti antitrust laws, to, to interfere in a marketplace that, going back to Rob's point at the beginning, really is giving more, not flawless, it certainly has its flaws, um, but is giving consumers more opportunities and more options today than it ever has. Right? It's a good time to be a consumer if you want to watch programming. Okay, so with the time we have left, I'm going to uh, throw back to Brad to handle, unless, were there any other panelists, I'm sorry, were there any other panelists who want to weigh in on that point, or should we turn to questions from our audience? Can, can I just underscore one quick point? Please. Which is, uh, uh, Chairman Lee would point out, at the FCC, certainly every time there's a major merger, even a minor merger, all sorts of parties come to the FCC asking for conditions. They're either opposing it outright, uh, but really want a condition that helps them, or they're, they're maybe they are purely opposing it outright. But uh, there's a lot of that, as you described it, rent-seeking rent behavior. So that's important for folks to understand how, you know, how the process really and works. And there's nothing wrong with it. That's the process, by the way, right? People get to go in and they get to, they get to appeal to the agencies. This is a bad thing. This violates the law. Please stop it. The agencies but have to make those decisions. Presumably, you guys, all the regulators up here, developed a keen sense for when something appeared to be pure rent-seeking behavior versus when something seemed to be kind of the canary in the coal mine with respect to consumers. And, and I think that's, where, that's why we want smart, good people in government to make those, those uh, discerning judgments. Okay, I'm going to uh, grab the wireless mic and play Geraldo here for a minute. Oh, you guys have the mics, okay. And Brad is gonna recognize any of you from the audience. Remember, raise your hand and speak loudly. All right, we'd like to hear from you guys. If you'd stand up, be recognized, tell us your name and your affiliation or interest in, in this panel. You can direct it to a panelist, direct it to the panel, up to you, depending on your question, who's first. Yes, ma'am. Stand up, tell us who you are and affiliation and your question. Hi, I'm Katie McAuliffe. I'm with Americans for Tax Reform, Digital Liberty. Um, I, I cannot remember who, I'm sorry, but um, someone said that it's basically the medium that's the driver of content, not content that's driver of the channel. I think, yeah. right, I think what I said is that, is that um, carriage creates valuable content, valuable content doesn't create carriage. So, and I can see where you're talking about valuable content doesn't create carriage, but I think over the top and actual like YouTube channels and that sort of thing actually do create a lot of value. So they do have their own independent you know, um, things. And even if you look at RSS feeds, people have their own clip shows. I have some friends who do comedy things. They're actually making a living off of that in New York. I don't know how that works. But those, so those sorts of things I feel like shouldn't be discounted because I don't think it's the, the carriage. Now, when you're talking about whether there's enough bandwidth, that's interesting. But my phone actually does pretty well with video. Like, I've watched full series on there. So I just kind of wanted to hear comments on why, I guess, why over the top is it considered content driving the market? Um, okay, so, so look, I, I, there's a couple different aspects to your question. I think that, first of all, I had in mind when I was making that statement, specifically the, the sort of the pay TV market as we know it today, and my only point there was that, that it's, it's the benefits that, that that the provider derives from carriage, which is being in a large enough number of homes to, to be able to, to monetize that from an advertising perspective, uh, to be able to monetize that from an affiliate fee perspective. Those economics come back into the network which are invested in the content, which you then allows you to produce in, you know, I think I you spoke about Mad Men before, that may be four or five plus million dollars an episode. So my only point there was that the economics of, of having broad carriage actually enable a programmer to create valuable content. Valuable content is, of course, in and of itself a little bit of a, you know, we're talking about something very, very squishy. What is valuable to one may not be valuable to another. In the, in, in, in what I, when you say OTT, OTT 
doesn't mean much unless you get a little bit more granular. YouTube is theoretically OTT, Netflix is OTT, and Hulu is OTT, and I can find Amazon three... Amazon Prime over well, OTT? Well, there's, there, there's Amazon Prime, there's Hulu, there's Hulu yeah. Plus, you know, you could go on and on. There's, there, yeah. there's multiple models out there outside of the pay TV market, but, but the bottom line is, is I would agree that, that, um, that folks today can create content and get a lot of views and people will enjoy it, and, um, and that's a good thing. Um, I think that, that so far there are, you know, we, there are limits as, as, as to what you can do with the economics. You know, most, even the most successful YouTubers for the most part are sitting in their kitchen or in their bedroom and they got a single camera and they're, they're delivering their five minute segment and they're getting millions of views and, and I'm sure that's making a lot of people happy. But, but um, that, is, that is not um, the full, st I don't think you can necessarily say that that, 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 that is the, the, the answer uh, to everything we've been talking about because there are sort of natural economic limits to what kind of content can be produced within that model. So I'm sorry if you guys will just indulge me two more like short questions. Well, let's, let's do one follow-up because there's a lot of Okay, then I'll here. skip the HBO question. Okay. So we're not saying the medium is the message. Oh, We've I'm moved away from that, right? No, I don't think I was ever said the medium was the message. Would anyone say the medium <laughs> is the message? Okay. Can I, can I comment briefly? Uh, implicit in the question is the notion that over-the-top video or Internet-distributed video is going to be readily available. One of the questions that comes up uh, in the merger context is whether uh, a vertically integrated ISP, which also produces content, uh, or an ISP that even doesn't produce content, has an incentive to uh, restrict the de development of OTT, which is competitive to their video offerings, and through usage caps uh, uh, and, other, and other means uh, make it difficult for people to enter the market through over-the-top distribution or limit their ability to distribute. Uh, Netflix uh, 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 problems with, with Comcast is, is, a, is a widely publicized instance of that, uh, but uh, you've, got, you've got many other possibilities. So, so, so it, it is not irrelevant to, to the consideration of mergers to, in, to ensure that steps are taken to make sure that over-the-top distribution can develop and flourish. Next question. Yes, sir. We'll get your microphone. Thank you. Uh, John Mayo from Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. Let me go back to the beginning of the discussion, and there was a discussion about independent programming and diversity, and just picking up on uh, John's point and Michael's point, I just wanted to sort of think back to the sort of standard of consumer welfare and, 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 and or consumer harm uh, turning the tide for whether to approve or not approve a merger. And we were talking about diversity, and I guess the question, the thing that we focused on a bit was about the role of independent programmers in creating that diversity. And I guess my question back to really all of the panelists or whoever would like to address it is what's the, is to bore in a bit more on the role of consumers in driving that diversity. Do, do consumers have perhaps a bigger voice today or at least as loud a voice as they have ever had in driving that diversity? What is it specifically about the marketplace that is prohibiting uh, the demands for diversity by consumers to be satisfied both within the traditional pay market and outside that pay market. Let me talk about the traditional pay market. Uh, it is very difficult for independent programmers to get distribution in the traditional pay market. There are retransmission consent agreements with traditional broadcasters which link retransmission consent to having access for, for additional channel carriage. The large programmers, your discoveries and, and uh, scripts, 
uh, bundle their offerings uh, so that in order to get the Discovery Channel, you got to get Animal Planet for kids and, and, and these other things, uh, Discovery Health, things like that, uh, which, which take away uh, uh, the offerings. So the uh, channels uh, that, uh, that uh, including the ones that are, that are uh, on this panel, that might have a lot of interest to consumers can't get on because of the, because of these various tying arrangements, and uh, and that's a big problem. Over the top, I won't address different set of issues. Well, I would say it's it's. I, I think I, I referred to a little bit earlier. The the reason why consumers are not going to drive diversity is because they would need to be demanding something that they are not aware of. Right, and so you know, I, I I think I read somewhere that Steve Jobs said no consumer ever demanded the iPod. Right, it, it was only when the iPod was delivered that people said, "Wow, this is great." And so I believe when it comes to 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 media, um, uh, the content is it has to be created and delivered to determine whether or not there's a resonance or or or, or an appetite. Uh, for it, um, it's really the uh, it's really up to whether you know the government and the First Amendment and whether we think those are really applicable sort of influential drivers to to either promote an environment where diversity of content is is a core value um, or it's not. But I don't I don't think we're going to see consumers rising up and saying, you know, I need more content that looks like this. It's very difficult to, to, for that to happen. Final question? Yes, ma'am. Good morning. I'm Camille. Um, for the former FCC and commissioners, oh. um, can you please discuss the public interest standard and what factors go into your interpretation of the public interest and standard? Where, where are you from? Just interested. Okay, good. Sure. Oh, you want me to go first? You want to go first? You're, you're, you're alphabetically, you're more senior. You're the gray beard of the two of us. So. <laughs> you have you more go hair. first. You have hair somewhere. <laughs> uh, well, the public interest standard, I, I have to admit, is can be somewhat subjective. And you might find, as we go between Rob and I, we might have a different view of what it is. I mean, in this case, I think it, it has to do with what benefits the overall market for diversity of voices as a key factor in a, in a, a media context. I mean, in other contexts, it might have to do with competition or prices uh, for consumers. Um, it, it could vary depending on the, on the condition, and it, to some degree, is uh, conditional in that sense. You know, it's, it's, it can be, what do we see as the effect ultimately on, on the marketplace, on consumers, on competition of some kind of combination or license transfer? Uh, the Communications Act, in particular, has other areas where you see that, it, for example, as I said earlier, uh, sees diversity of voices as being in the public interest. Um, so you can take that as a guide within the Communications Act to say, does this increase the diversity of voices or not? Uh, and you could analyze any specific uh, transaction based on that. I mean, it's, it's a license transfer that gives you the ability to get into uh, a, the, the public interest. Um, and there's a ostensibly a, uh, particularly in the area of licenses, there's a, a shortage inherently so that there's not infinite ability to get the message across. Now that's changing as technology uh, moves forward, but it still remains a, a big issue. So uh, I hope that answers the question. I'll turn it over to Rob. So, and, and, and that's perfect. The uh, short answer, too, is uh, the public interest standard is whatever uh, majority of the commissioners say it is in reality. Um, and in the context of a merger, um, the companies that are combining uh, agree. Uh, voluntarily uh, or not. Maybe they walk away from the deal if it's too much for them, but they'll agree voluntarily to whatever the conditions are, allegedly in the public interest, um, and therefore they're not going to appeal to the courts uh, uh, the decision by the FCC, right? Um, so in terms of a court, uh, uh, someone bringing a case saying that condition shouldn't have been brought because that was not in the public interest, I can't think of when that's ever happened. I don't think it ever has, and that's why. But it's basically what a majority of the commissioners uh, think it is, and then um, they can coerce it out of the companies. Yeah. It's the subjective nature of it. 
It, it, well, I mean, I think there's, there's no doubt that the public interest test is more subjective than, say, the antitrust law that you apply in a merger. And I'll just, Camille, just going back to your point, um, at the, uh, at the antitrust agencies apply Section 7 of the Clayton Act, and it says, you shall, you shall try to block this deal. You have to go to a court, which is different than in Europe, where the regulators can just block something or find someone without going to court. You shall block this. You shall go block this deal if it may substantially lessen competition. And competition, going back to the previous question, isn't just about price, although it is about price. It is also about choice. But it's a, it's a, it's a more focused, um, so that if you're losing, for example, if two supermarket chains merge, and you're losing all the supermarkets in your area because they want to close them down, that may be a choice issue for antitrust. Um, but it is also true that when you look at choice, I think, in the context of of, 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 of media and in the context of independent programmers or just programming generally, consumers have never seen more choices than they are seeing right now. Not to say that the, the system is perfect because of course it isn't. And sometimes the quality programs are the ones that aren't picked up and sometimes the direct or the, the I don't know if that's a curse word in Yiddish. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes the, uh, sometimes, Look, I'll just redact that. The, um, sometimes uh, uh, the, uh, the less quality programming may be, and sometimes there are, 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 are programmers who want to bundle different things together and force them on the MVPDs, as you know. Um, but, uh, but having said that, it, you know, just look at 30 years. You don't have to go back to like the, the NBC uh, case from the 1940s. You just really look at, you know, or even when we were, but, but if you look at when we were growing up and there were, you know, three networks and then a fourth, um, you know, you just consumers see a lot more. It's it's a great it's 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 the the most wonderful thing about sort of technology and uh, and um, and the, the the marketplace. It's really brought consumers a lot more choice than uh, they've ever had before, for better or worse. I just add, if you get more choices, that doesn't mean you can't have even more. I mean, you look at over the top as the future, where there be more voices, but then you look at um, interconnection issues, and you look at uh, a study that was done recently by the. Um, Open Technology Institute and Measurement Lab looked at what happened, and there was some constriction of bandwidth uh, on uh, on the by the by the ISPs. So that can limit choice. So do we look at something like that? I mean, the, the fact that there's more choice doesn't inherently say, well, then we don't have to worry about it. In fact, if there's still the ability well, to limit question, additional no, no, choice, and that's why you have and that's why you have an FCC, and that's why you have an antitrust division. Uh, you know, that can stay involved even after you know that will that will review these deals. And even if they approve them, which I suspect they will and think they should, um, uh, you know, can go back in. That's and, news right there. Okay. Uh, and <laughs> and it's not. It doesn't make news because I'm not a commissioner anymore. But um, <laughs> either way. <laughs> uh, 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 but uh, uh, but you know, they can always go back in and, and bring cases if there are problems in the marketplace, and they do. Well, thanks to our great panel on behalf of Georgetown and the School of Business, uh, the McDonough Center the Center for Business and Public Policy, our School of Continuing Studies. We appreciate your time. We thank the audience for attending. David, would you give a token of appreciation to each of our members? We hope that this will sit on your desk and be a fond remembrance of the panel that you so graciously participated in. Thank you all for coming, and let's have a round of applause for our panel. <laughs>